verse that is probably one of my favorite verses. And it's found in Acts chapter 20. And it's a verse that when I ended up crashing years ago from trying to live my life underneath the law, this verse really hit home to me. And it's, it's kind of a, what is it called when you, on your, your uh, tombstone, you put your, what is it called, a epitaph. epitaph, okay? You put that on there, and this is kind of the epitaph, I think, of the Apostle Paul. Verse 24 says, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus which was to testify solemnly of this gospel of grace of God. That is my plea. Whatever I'm doing, if I'm not working at Christian Life Ministries anymore, if I'm working somewhere else, I hope that my plea will be to testify solemnly to this gospel of grace. It is what my life is committed to. I, I believe it is a gospel that, in my mind, is not being preached that often. I think there are a lot of people preaching it, but it's not that often being preached. I think that it is a gospel that is freeing. When I have seen what happened in my own life, when I've seen what happened in other people's lives, where the gospel of grace begins to set a person free to become all that God intended them to be, the people that are frightened by the law say, you can't do that because people will just start sinning. I have never witnessed that in my life. Every person that really grabs grace and grabs a hold of grace outperforms any law person. Now, they may not be as busy as the law person, but they outperform them. Because remember what we said, Jesus said in John 15, he says, I am the true vine and you're the, the branches. Every branch that abides in me bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't bear fruit. So when I say that we're out producing, I'm saying that the, produ or the fruit that we are producing is the life of Christ being produced through us. And it's the fruit that's going to last when the consuming fire comes. It will last. And that's the kind of fruit that comes out of people that understand grace. I don't know anybody that, that grabs and understands grace that doesn't, first of all, outgive people that are under law. They, because no longer, see the law, I can go ahead and say, all right, quote, 10%. I've got it. I feel pretty good, 10%. And then when I get a little extra come in, I think, well, should that fall in the 10 or not? And then I, person under grace basically says, Father, what do you want to do with your money? Sometimes God may ask you to do things that nobody in here would ever think of doing with that. Matter of fact, I doubt that very many of you have gone back to the Old Testament when they used to tithe back there and give back there, and they lived a long ways from the temple. And so after they piled up their resources, which was the first of all their fruits, then they piled up their resources, God said, now, I just wanted you to know where those resources came from. They came from me. Those are the first year fruits. Now go buy hard liquor and have a party. Did you know that was in the Bible? How many of you heard that preached? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. God just says, I just want you to know. Now celebrate, and the, and the celebration is praise to me. You're praising me. Now, grace can ask you to do something like that. Now, don't walk out of here thinking Bill's told me to go buy hard liquor and I meet you all down at the store, okay? I just want you to realize that some, grace, grace will outperform law any day. And when we get to next week's topic, which is obedience springing forth, you will see that out of you, out of the message that truly is the grace of God, it is amazing what you'll end up doing and the fruit that you'll see bear. This ministry right now today uh, it's got a big sign out that says Christian Life Ministries, non-denominational biblical counseling. I did not think this would be evangelical. And yet we've seen well over 3,000 people one-on-one -on -one pray to receive Christ by just presenting grace to people. And so God will allow you to bear fruit in this. Don't be frightened by it. The first thing we have down here is I want you to look at the definition, what we call grace. Now, the wording of this is a little weak. But I want you to look at what we call grace. We're going to talk about grace an awful lot today. Uh, we're going to even have the last half of here where we can really ask some questions and do some talking on it. But I want you to look back at this definition often in your life. 
God's kindness and graciousness towards us humanity without regard to our merit. Now, note that. It's not regard to your merit. It's not regard to anything you deserve. Okay, or what we deserve or our weaknesses to all of us who receive in spite of what we deserve. Now, the reason it's worded that way is that it's not just that you didn't deserve this, but if you got what you really deserved, you'd be in trouble. And God's graciousness and kindness towards us without due to any merit, and yet you're going to see today the tendency to every person I've ever talked to, most everybody in the Bible, and I know most everybody here today, we have some mentality in the back of our mind that we're going to pay him back. We, he, look what he did for us. So I owe him my life. I'm going to pay him back. Now, in an essence, we owe him our life, okay? But you can't pay God back. The moment you think you can pay God back, it no longer is grace. It becomes something else. As long as he expects something paid back from you, it's no longer grace. It's another word. When you go ahead and give things to people and you give it, say, oh, this is free grace, but you expect something back, it's no longer grace. But we have a tendency to do that. Now we're going to start with what grace did, first of all, at salvation. And you've got words that are used in the Bible. We won't go into a lot of the words. But the one basic justification is the biggest problem was sin. You and I were born in it. Matter of fact, it says, your mother conceived you in sin. You were isolated and separated from God from the very beginning of your birth. And you were born that way. It says in Romans 3, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together, they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. That all kind of includes all of us. We're all pretty much caught there. And we were born into that. Now, if we'll look at Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3. This is one picture of what we looked like before this. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." It's awesome what goes on after this, the next verse, though. But God being rich in His mercy, and it goes on into His grace. The solution for our deliverance was grace. And in essence, we got a second chance. We got a second chance. Your penalty, my penalty for sin, was death. Now, sometimes people say, well, then couldn't we just die if we, if we gave our life for God? No, because remember last time we talked about you don't possess the life that can be given. You only possess natural life, human life. You do not possess spiritual life before you are a believer. You don't have that, so you can't offer that up. Only one person possessed that life, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, Adam possessed it before he died. But Jesus Christ possessed that life, so only he could die. Only he could die for you and me. We couldn't do it ourselves. It was an impossibility. We were sunk. And there was no possible way that we could ever come back. Now, forgiveness is not accomplished by your confession. Forgiveness is accomplished through the cross of Christ. He is the object of my faith, not my faith. Now, here I'm going to give you an illustration. Kathy, you're from Texas, correct? Anybody, anybody further south than that? What's that? I'm also from Texas. Oh, okay, so we got two from Texas. Now, I'm going to take some liberty here and, uh, and, and consider that you were totally ignorant of the North. And you come up here for your first time. You've been down in Texas. And we're up here, and we're going to show you something. We're going to show you that uh, <coughs> we have these awesome lakes in the summer that are really cool lakes. And you look at them and say, what beautiful lakes here. And you go up to Pactola. 
We drive up to Pactola and we say, let's go and we go run and you, we run and we're ready to jump onto the lake. Well, if you've never been around northern ice, which in your mind was just water that had somehow gotten hardened, you're very frightened by that. And people that have never been around ice, they'll walk up to this stuff and they'll think, I can't, I can't believe it because they've never seen this happen. And so they, they'll, they'll barely put their toe just on this thing. And of course, what happens when you put it even on solid ice? <laughs> this big old crack and they jump back off of here and they're nervous and they're sweating. And they think finally, so finally they get tiptoe out and they get a little teeny bit on the edge, but they're not going very far. They want to know, I can grab the side of this thing if I go through. Now, normally in the middle of February, you can drive a truck across this stuff. But it isn't your faith that holds you up. It's the object of your faith. Now, if I have lived here all my life and I know that I can go out here and actually put a house out here and I can sit down and I can fish or I can drive and, and I grew up on ice skate so I could just skate around here, I might enjoy the ice more thoroughly than you. But my faith isn't holding me up any more than your weak faith is. Does that make sense? See, sometimes people think that it's our faith that somehow holds us up. It is not your faith. It is the object of your faith, and the object of our faith is Christ. Your pleading for forgiveness didn't give you forgiveness. The cross of Jesus Christ forgave you, period. You didn't have anything to do with it. All you do is acknowledge it so you can experience the freedom of that forgiveness. And that's the same way as we go into some, some different issues here, and that is that as we go into uh, now after the justification, after you have been saved by grace alone, it says not by any works lest you should even attempt to boast, but by only grace alone you're saved. But the problem that happens, and it happened with the Galatian people, is they thought, now we're saved by grace, but you know what? We still need to work to, you know, now to keep it. Okay? We need to work to stay in somehow good a satisfaction with our God. And so we go on. And that's why he says, oh, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? I want to ask you two questions. Did you begin this Christian walk by grace or by works? And the answer was obvious to them. That, well, by grace alone. Then why do you think you can continue this Christian life in grace or in works? Because you can't. Because it profits you nothing. And so a lot of times it says many people think that they're living by grace, especially after salvation, but they still try to add something to grace or believe that they can pay God back for his grace. It is true that we owe God everything, but you cannot and do not do nothing to pay him back. Now, Romans 4.4, and we're building this a little while, and then we're going to take off on something here in a minute. But Romans 4.4 is an illustration that I think is a good verse in relating to this. And it says, Now to one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. You see, when you and I work, you don't go into your boss after you've worked, and you've worked really hard, and you work to come in and get your check, and you're just so, oh, great, well, that is, I can't believe you gave me that. No, you go in there, and if he doesn't give you the right amount, you sit there and figure up the hours. You say, hey, hey, wait a minute, I didn't get enough hours here. The why? Because you worked for that. That is something that is due you. That's something that should do you. And Romans 4.4 4 says this is the illustration they're using. When a person works, you know, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to those who do not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Let me give you an illustration of this that I thought was really neat. At least it hit me this week, and that was, uh, you all know the story of the prodigal son in Luke uh, chapter 15. And the prodigal son goes off, and he, he, he's got all these wealth, wealth and resources available to him. He goes off, he squanders everything, lives a uh, polluted life, and, and when he's without everything, and he's down eating the slop with the pigs, he comes to his senses and he says, I cannot, even my, my people back there that work for him eat better than this. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to go back to him. And, and now look what's in his mind as he's going back. He's going back and he's going to go back and he says something to his father. And his father, remember, comes running out to meet him. But what does he say to his father? 
I'm not worthy to be counted your son, but as a servant. Okay, I'm not worthy to be your son, but let me work for you and pay back what I owe. Let me work for your forgiveness to me. God did not let him do that. That is the mindset that the world system has squeezed me and you into. Whether you know it or not, if you're open to this, we have a tendency to think we can work for something. We can pay him back. Look at the older brother who uh, was mm -hmm. a legalist. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, oh, I did all this and that. Same thing. Same thing. Somehow we can work for this stuff. Now, I'm, we're going to do something today that's going to just be more of a kind of a, a little cooperation here. But before we do, I want to give you an example that I heard this last year that was a, a tremendous example. Uh, I've used it in relating to all kinds of things. I've used it in relating to coaching. I've used it relating to different things. But the illustration that we're going to give you is an illustration of how you relate grace to law and giving some freedom to bondage. There was a guy that was, uh, he was a trapeze artist, and uh, <clears throat> he was pretty good at what he did. And a long time ago, if you, we had circuses, the trapeze artist, deal, well, that was a big deal. Now we've gotten so sophisticated into uh, all this different type of technology that they're kind of losing their, at least, pull on us. And the trapeze artist would do all kinds of fascinating things, and underneath the trapeze artist, they had this huge net that they'd have down there, especially when they got the trapeze artist up to, you know, 60, 70 feet. And a guy walked up to the trapeze artist, and he asked him, he said, uh, he was talking to him about the net, and he said, he was visiting about the net, and he said, so the net's down there to save your life, huh? And the guy says, yeah, the net is there, so in case we fall, that it does save our life. But that is not at all the main purpose of the net. He says, what do you mean it's not the main purpose of the net? I thought that the net was there so if you fell, you wouldn't get killed. He said, oh, that is true that it's there for that reason, so that when we fall, that we have the ability to go ahead and not get killed. <laughs> but but the, main, the main issue, the main reason we have a net is so that we'll get better. He says, I don't understand you. He said, you see, if I was up 75 feet in the air and I was going to go ahead and go from this uh, little letter to that letter, I'm not letting go until I have a hold of this. And so all I would learn to do is do this. Mm -hmm. This is all I would learn to do. I would not take a chance at anything else. But because of the net, I can try double twi you know, twist back flips. I can try things and miss it and fall down to the net and get to jump right back up onto that net and go. Are you catching the picture? Let me show you how that works as a coach and a kid. You've got a basketball player. This basketball player, uh, if any of you know about basketball, there's a player out there called Jason Williams. Anybody know who this guy is? He's, uh, he's a guy that throws passes that nobody's ever seen before. Okay? And so you have a kid that's grown up. Pistol Pete was a good example. And Pistol Pete did things before people ever did things. He, he, he made passes that would go like this and come around his back to people that no one did. Now, you have a coach that will only let you throw the two-hand, you know, thumb-out pass. And if the kid does anything different, he is benched or put on the seat. If he shoots when he doesn't make the basket or maybe shoots when he, he thinks he shouldn't be, he's pulled and put on the bench. So you're going to have a kid that is conscious every single time, conscious every single time he shoots the basket, is, am I going to be in trouble if I miss this basket? Uh, can I make this pass over here to Kenny? I, I, I better not try that pass. I could end up on the bench. So he'll, still, he'll start to live in fear, and it'll start to reduce his performance to taking chances and making mistakes. Now, a person that lives with a coach that basically says, you know, we want you to go ahead and you're free to try some things and we'll kind of sometimes have to restrain you sometimes. We might have to bridle you sometimes. But I want you to go ahead and go out there and sometimes learn to do things, create things, create things to happen. And they may take four three-point shots and he says, you know, you're shooting short, but quit. Don't stop shooting. I want you to continue playing. Now, that person will grow in his ability far beyond the person that is stifled by just the laws and rules. Talk to a person and talk to a guy that played under those two systems. Because I've played under both those systems. 
And I've played under systems where I was told not to swing at any ball that was even close to being out of the strike zone. Matter of fact, there was a, something that just didn't make sense to me. Those of you that know baseball, I'm up standing at the plate, and if, if the pitch got up here and you swing, they say, quit swinging at high pitches. But they tell pitchers, keep the ball down, don't get the pitch up, because if you get the pitch up, they'll hit it out of the park. Now, does, how does that make sense? Okay? Okay. Pitchers, don't get the ball up, because they'll knock it out of the park. Batters, don't you dare swing at an up pitch. Anybody ever thought of that? I finally got somebody that quit telling me when I had to swing and said, just go up there and cut loose. And uh, my son called me from North Carolina and uh, at the first of this year, his fall season this year, and I said, how's it going? He goes, oh, not very good. And I said, how come? And he says, well, I've been up six times and I've struck out four times. And I said, what what'd you do? No, he said, I've, I've been up eight times and I've struck out four times. I said, what'd you do the other times? He says, I walked. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, you're not... You've walked four times out of eight, and you struck out four. How many of those were called pitches? And he said, well, three of them. So I'm seeing this guy that's not swinging the bat. He's probably looking, really getting very particular of what he swings at. And because of where he was at the year before, they had told him, we want you to get on base as much as you can by walking. Don't be swinging at anything that's bad. So he became a defensive hitter. And I said, you know, I'm, I haven't seen you, Nick. I haven't seen you play, and I haven't even seen you to play, but I can bet one thing. And I use an example that happens with heavyweight boxers. If you ever watched heavyweight boxing, you got a champion, and so Hollyfield is, is boxing or whoever is in charge, you know. The contender has to compete against him. He can't win by kind of fighting defensively. He has to go at him 100% if he's ever going to take the belt. You can't just go and fight an equal fight or they will give the belt to the champion, always. And I said, you know, you're a freshman there. They have not seen you play. You will not make the team walking. You, I guarantee you. I want you to consider that maybe you should get up there and be ready to pull the trigger and explode at anything, anything near it. As a matter of fact, make them think if you get the ball within bat's reach, you're in trouble. That's all I said. And uh, he thought he was under the old system. And so there's a little nervous. So his first next day out, he chanced it. He starts swinging a little bit, and he didn't get in trouble. And so I talked to him, uh, well, I talked to him this morning, but I talked to him last week, and this is after the whole fall season. I said, how are you doing? And he said, uh, I'm second on the team in hitting out of 40 people as a freshman, and I'm hitting third on the team. And I said, uh, are you swinging? He says, I am swinging at anything close. Okay? <laughs> now, that's just in a sporting event. In your life and my life, God gave us a system. He gave us a net underneath us. And the net is for us to be able to fall and get back up. And now, how does that put into, into human uh, skin on how you act and I act? And I'd like to at least challenge you with this. When I go ahead and I'm starting to get through this understanding I don't have to live under law and I'm beginning to embrace this grace message and I'm in, and, and beginning to embrace that life, Christ who is my life, dwells inside me and I'm trying to be, get familiar with His voice and how He directs me, there's times that my Father that is going to say something to me that might sound a little bit odd. And you know what? I can go for it. If somehow it's not Him, and somehow I, I got a little deceived here, and I took a chance, and I made a mistake, and I sinned. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again. I get to get back up on that, that, that bar, and I get to go for it again and say, Father, I just thought that was you. Sorry, I didn't hear you clearly. I want to get more familiar with your voice. But I can start trying things that I think God is telling me to do. And life begins to be lived freely rather than under the constrictions. Too many people that I know today, if God spoke to you something that seems a little contrary to what you think the religious traditions might tell you to do, you're just so bound that you can't do that, so you've, no, oh, I don't know, you're never supposed to do that. You're always supposed to fold hands when you pray. Okay, you're always supposed to do, close your eyes and do these types of things. And that, that is not at all true at all. 
And God might put onto your heart some things, people, in this room here, that if we said you heard God this week and what did he tell you? And, and he might have told you things. Now, he'll never, ever violate his scriptures. He'll never violate his word. But remember what we learned the first week? We have so much junk and religion in our head that we can violate all kinds of traditions and junk that we have been told by churches and groups and never were in the scriptures. And so living under a, a, a field of grace, living under a covering of grace where we have a net that's underneath us, we can try the double backflips. We can, we can make some attempts that you say, I'm going to go ahead and, and do this because I think it's what God's put on my heart to do. And I promise you when you start doing that, you'll find God using you in ways you could never predict. Can you see in your mind, especially we could even make it more personal than that, how we can get caught in our own traditions that we have locked in there and they can, they can prevent you from being able to jump off this trapeze? Can you see that? Yeah. I was just thinking of something that might be a little off, but I was thinking about how there's church is Christ's bride and you know Nancy's your bride and it was like that, that little thing of the you know, giving to the whatever. Sure. And actually if you actually if you said uh, you wanna love the Lord, you love the Lord? You wanna tell me that you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. Well, I love you, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, I want you to know that you love me. Do you feed my sheep? Now Please don't go out of here now thinking that, okay, boy, anything I want to do with my money now is okay. Not at all. I think you ought to be supporting the people that minister to you. You ought to be supporting where you fellowship. That is the things that, that you can find that you ought to be supporting. Those give to those that you believe in. Give to the place you believe. But in terms of saying, okay, is this bound underneath the law of the Torah? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're under the freedom of listening to God. And if, you, if we all were doing that, I promise you this, there'd be nobody hungry, there'd be nobody starving, there'd be nobody without, and the church would be working fine. But we don't. We have it differently. Just so you don't have to sit here and try to write and race and write all this stuff down to help us move a little bit, you're going to get this handout. <clears throat> I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to say, okay, by the verse that we read here, Tell me, what does it say about grace, and what does it say about law? Now, we're not going to get them all up here, and we're going to read some other ones to you. And when we're done, or in the process of where we are, as you look up here and you say that all these scriptures that say, this is what grace does, this is what law does, <coughs> I want you to think in your mind, is there any, any possible reason I would ever want to even tiptoe over here? Not even, somebody says, well, you got to have a little bit. Wait till we're done with this. It's like saying, we've got a little poison, but this is the kind that just kills immediately, but we'll just give you a little bit, okay? Romans 5, verse 20 and 21. And the law came in that the transgression or sin might increase. Okay, what did it say it does? <coughs> Okay, sin increases. The law came in that sin might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Okay, what happened here? Okay, grace abounds. It actually, if we want to even say it, it reigns over sin. Does that, is that accurate? Okay, so not only does it, that, but it reigns over sin. Okay, Romans 6, 14. <clears throat> sin shall not be master over you, for you are no longer under law, but you're under grace. Okay, if we're under law, sin is your master. Master's over you. If you're under grace... Basically, it says this, is that you are, sin shall not master over you, no longer your master. So sin, no longer a master. Romans 7, 4 and 5. 
Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law, <coughs> were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. So, sinful passions are aroused, they're aroused, and they do what? They bear fruit for death. They bear fruit for death. Just think, I mean, think of these words. Even in relationships, they bear fruit for death. If you're going to live under law with a husband or a girlfriend or whatever, you're going to bear fruit for death in that relationship. Over here, it says they what? And there it says that we were made to bear fruit for God. So far, we're looking, so far, where do we think we want to hang around? Okay, I, I don't see anything over there yet that it would like to be over there yet. Romans 7, 9. Seven, yeah, 7, 8. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So right here, if I get under grace, sin is dead. If I get over here, I covet of every kind. Now, remember the problem with the Pharisees and also the, the, the people in the New Testament and, and Colossae and, and those things. They were not saying, let's do away with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were saying, let's, do, let's, let's accept Jesus Christ and embrace Jesus Christ, but let's add to that. And they were adding things to it, adding circumcision or adding whatever they wanted to. They were saying, we could add some things to this. And if we added to it, then we'd have both of them. Now, just now look at what we're seeing so far. Why in the world would I add anything that would cause coveting, arouse death, sin being my master, and sin increases? Why would I want to do that? They can't coexist. <clears throat> Absolutely, they can't coexist because law demands perfection. You can't have a little bit of it. Romans 6, 18, and I'm, we're not going to read all the rest. I'm just going to go through. They said they're slaves of righteousness, and if I'm under the law, it's killing me. Sin becomes utterly sinful. Romans 8, 3, condemns sin in the flesh, but I become weak through my flesh if I live under law. Romans 8, 6 says under grace is life, law is death. The 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says grace gives life, the law kills, the letter kills. The veil is removed under grace. This is a good example of the veil in, in that verse in Corinthians is that the veil gets lifted when I live under grace and I get to hear what God's really saying. But if I live underneath the veil of Moses, the veil is not lifted and I cannot hear God. So the veil remains unlifted. So I can't hear those things. I can't see them. Man is justified under grace. Galatians 2.16, under law, no flesh is justified. Now, we just wrote some of them. I sat down and did this all in one 10-minute <coughs> session. You can take and go through all the scriptures. And here's the point I'm trying to have you see. If we wrote these all out here and you looked up here, can anybody see any reason why we would want to have a little bit of this? No. Any. But you know what? It's built inside us because we are so conformed to the world system. And the world system says, you are what you look like. You are what you own. You are what you do. And, and so what it's telling you is if you just do these things, and you've got to have these laws in your life or else you will absolutely take off. What is the greatest fear that we have? And we say, well, you know what? If you don't have some law in your life, we just, boy, we're going to become utterly sinful. If that's the case in your mind, then you did not hear Pat teaching about your new nature and your new identity. Folks, because your new identity is absolutely longing to do whatever God wants you to do. It doesn't like doing the opposite. It has no desire to do it. It's grieved when it does that. When you hurt somebody, you, you, you get grieved. There's a grieving in your that causes repentance. Now, if you just sin and you don't have any grieving, then I'd check your salvation. I'd check and say, maybe I haven't responded to this. Maybe even in my salvation, I thought I got there by my own effort. And you need to go back and look at it because you can't earn this thing. Now, I'm open for something right here before we go on. I'm open for this. 
You think we ought to have, and in your mind, don't be so frightened here, okay? Because this ought to be in your mind. You ought to be thinking this a little bit. Remember, didn't we use the example up here? Didn't I use the example up here last time of going on a diet? And I start here at zero axiom. Did I talk to you about that? Nobody remember that? Yeah. Okay. okay. When you sin, you go, well, to you this is positive. When I sin, I go over here to negative one. A grace abounds all the more. I go to zero to two. If I sin, I go to zero. Grace abounds all the more. Puts me to one. Puts me to two. I sin once again. I go to one. Sin, grace abounds all the more. Puts me to two. Puts me to three. I'm way up here at three. And how did I get here? Sinning. Does that make sense to you? By sinning, I got here. So in your mind, if you're really hearing what the Apostle Paul is saying, if you're really hearing him say this stuff in Romans chapter 5, because he's saying that very thing, then grace abounds all the more. <clears throat> that as sin reigned in death, so even grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life. What shall we say then? This is what ought to be going through your head and my head. If we're really hearing this, this ought to be the next question we ask. And Paul knows the question you and I will ask. And he says, what shall we say then? Should we just continue in sin so that grace may abound? But he, then he says, God forbid, may it never be, because how shall we who have died to this old man, how should we ever continue in that? Everything inside Bill Ewing wants to do right before God. That doesn't mean I always will. But the real me, you see, I don't have to be frightened by this real me. I don't have to be scared by him. People that live under law, they're frightened that if you, oh, you don't know me, man. If you knew me, if you knew what was in here, I know what's in here because God has defined your heart. Man looks on the outer appearance. Now, I don't mean that your flesh isn't capable of some rotten stuff because mine is too and it always will be. But my nature built inside my heart longs for the things of God. And if you let that person come out, he isn't going to go sin. That's the righteousness has been declared to you. Justification, just as if you had never sinned. You and I are going to stand before this holy God just as if we had never sinned. Ever. And he's going to go ahead and say, enter in, good and faithful servant, enter into me. Not by the works of your hand, but by the grace of God and his mercy that he poured it out upon you. He, you were born into his kingdom. There's not one person in this room that had one bit to do with being born from your parents. You did not go tell your parents to make love. You didn't kind of whisper into their ears something. You didn't have a thing to do with it. And folks, you didn't have anything to do with being born in the spiritual world either. God chose you before the foundation of the world. Matter of fact, he even says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go forth and bear fruit. And I have declared you as righteous. And all you simply did was receive that gift that was offered to you. And now he says, now, why in the world do you think you can continue in working under the works of the law? Like Colossians, do not touch, do not taste, do not feel, do not do this. He says, all of these give the appearance of religion. But they have no profit against any fleshly indulgence. None. They don't profit you at all. You can't change your life by those things. What if we went on that place and the person that was in, in grace that felt, hey, this is what I feel God's asked me to do, and let's say that it was wrong. That's what we were talking about, the net. The net's there to catch them so that they can get up again and take off. If I don't have that net, then I have to stay locked right here. I'll never, ever hear anything different. That's the, that's the point that was being made, is that if I just lock underneath, just uh, my only restriction is this, and this is all I got, and I'm going to live right here, I could possibly miss all kinds of places that God has asked me to give. Now, if I gave, and it happened to be wrong, what we're trying to say is that there's a net there that catches us, and that's why it says the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again. That was kind of the point, and I think that's a good point, Kenny, with that, is in each of our lives, it's not that I'm telling you at all what you should do with that. But what I'm hoping that the grace and the net gives you is freedom to, to hear God and say, you know what, God, that is so contrary to my traditions and my doctrine that, and it doesn't contradict Scripture, but it's so hard for me to buy. And so we want to go in that direction. I'll take too much more time. But my question is not a grace and law question. It's a, it's a revelation question. Oh, how are you hearing the revelation of God? You know what, I mean, okay. How do, I, how do I know what's, what God's speaking without God's word? Right. As the background. Okay, excellent, excellent. God's will, what day is we doing? <laughs> That's actually going to be the whole thing of God's will. Is how do we do that? Uh, 
let, me, let me touch on a couple more verses here. And the tendency that we have, the tendency that we have as believers, now remember, I'm making the assumption that Scripture says that we all have been squeezed into the world's mold. And the, we, the world's mold is a performance-based mold. Satan's whole strategy is something on your performance, that you can go ahead and act independent of God by your performing, God will love you and accept you. And so we're squeezed into it. We've, we've been molded that way. So it's hard kind of to, to think outside those lines because of that mold. Most of the time, if we get people that are teaching law, and we get people that are proclaiming law, we feel, let's bring a bunch of grace people into that, and we'll change the law people. And I want to read some scriptures and, and show you what happens. Uh, if we got somebody in here infected with uh, measles, and the rest of us don't have measles, we don't go get that guy with the measles better by all hanging around him because we don't have them. <coughs> measles are contagious. You get a bad fruit, bad apple, you don't go ahead and say, well, let's put a bunch of good apples with that because if you do, that bad apple will get good. No, the opposite will happen. Sin increases. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's exactly right. That's what the verse is all about. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So then what does it say? Get it out from amongst you. Let me read something to you here that I think is important that we understand. In Titus chapter 1, verse 10, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers. Now the word empty talkers is also the same word that is being used in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, uh, verse 6. These are empty talkers, fruitless discussion, same one. Now, both of them are talking about law. And we'll come back to that other verse in just a second. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. Remember, they're deceiving. They're empty talkers. Especially those of, here it says, the circumcision, or those of the Torah, or those of the law, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not be teaching for the sake of their own sordid gain. Now let's go back to Titus, I mean to Timothy. For the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, empty talkers, straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions. That means there's no fruit at all in what they're talking about. So why listen to the fruit? Their fruit bears death. What are they talking about? They're wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they're making their confident assertions. But we know the law is good if it's used lawfully. What is the law used for? Realizing this, that the law is not made for us righteous men, it's made for the sinners and the non-believers. Okay, that's what the purpose of it was. Now, you've heard two verses, and there are actually two verses that talk about the temple being, uh, your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians talks about it. And now both places have different words. Here's what it's referring to. One is saying that this earthen vessel right here is a temple that God lives in. He dwells within this body. He chose to take himself and put it within this container. Okay? Okay? And so he dwells there by the power of the Holy Spirit. The other verse that's talking about the temple is plural. We are the temple of God. And actually, that's the verse that's saying, so do not let a little leaven leaven the whole lump. That means we are the temple of God, and if somebody comes in proclaiming law, matter of fact, he doesn't say, well, just kind of hang around. He says, remove him from the midst of you. That's pretty drastic. Do you know that Paul, when he went to Peter or Cephas, when he went to him and argued to his face, what is the one thing that Paul would not tolerate? Law and legalism. And he came and he talked. Now, if you look at the picture here. you got Peter, who was with Jesus as one of the twelve. And Paul addressed him to his face and was very, very forceful in saying, we will not let anything come in to my gospel, Paul says, which is the gospel of grace. 
Now remember, Paul spent 15 years in the wilderness with Jesus getting this gospel. And, he was in, and when he writes the book of Galatians, he says, wait a minute, folks, I'm telling you something. I was, I, I'm not saying something in my own flesh here. I spent 15 years, 14 years, and Christ gave me this as a revelation that this is a, new, this is a gospel, the gospel of the new covenant, which I'm going to proclaim to you. It is the gospel of grace. When you begin to embrace this type of life, it is a much easier life. You know the word yoke that Jesus says, come to me, you are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you? The word yoke there is actually the, is the word that's used for a law. The law that you've been carrying is heavy, it's burdensome, it's weighty, it's, it demands all these things, and it doesn't even demand a relationship. But my law, which is my yoke, is light, it's easy. It's not weary to your body. And so what we're trying to say is this is a real freeing way of living. But it's so tough because pretty much everything around us starts to call us the other direction. Gosh, you've got to have a little bit of law here. And I'm saying a little bit of law leavens the whole lump and will begin to destroy because it demands perfection. We want to embrace this gospel of grace. And from salvation, you didn't do anything, and after salvation. Now, I know this is going to really hit a lot of people here. I want you to go and I want you to wrestle with it yourself, but I'm going to go ahead and say something that some of the hair in the back of your neck is going to rise up again. <clears throat> everything that we've been talking about here, everything that we've talked about the last four weeks, if you and your doctrine believe you can lose your salvation, then you don't believe what we're talking about. Okay, now that's, that's in that boy, we're really touching on some things now, aren't we? Okay? If you can lose your salvation, you never had grace because it could be paid for. Okay, now, I'm not saying believe me for this and you have to believe me to be in this class, but I'm saying you've got to find a whole different model to live life. Just accept that. Don't say, all right, we're, we don't buy any of this stuff. No. We have put together a model that we believe the scriptures are teaching. The scriptures are teaching by grace and grace alone, not, not just for salvation, but after salvation. The Galatian people are same place. And if you're going to em em embrace this whole teaching, then what you're coming down to is that God alone dwelling in my life brings about my righteousness and my salvation and everything else. And he's the one that continues in it. And nothing can separate me from that. Now, if you don't believe that, and you say, oh, I think you can go over here and do all these things, and you can lose that which you were given freely, then you have to go ahead and somehow keep working to pay for it. Then at least be honest with yourself that you have to work to keep your salvation. You have to at least admit that to yourself. And I'm not saying that you're all dead wrong here. It's up to you. But don't try to live the gospel and the model that we're teaching of grace if you don't believe that. Because if you're in the back of your mind saying, well, I just still got to keep doing all these works over here, and if I just keep doing this stuff, uh, I hopefully will get to heaven. Well, then that's on the basis of what? Your works keep you there or get you there. At least admit that to yourself. Don't fool yourself. So by grace have you been saved. Yeah. Um, what about, like, you said you had to acknowledge the grace. What if you no longer acknowledge the grace? Are you mm -hmm. still saved? In my book, absolutely, because you didn't have anything to do with it. Now, if you're not appropriate in that, now, what we're talking about is your birth, the birth that you were born into the kingdom. When you were born in by justification, that it happened just as if you'd never sinned. God came and he paid the ransom. The word, actually, uh, propitiation is your ransom. He paid the ransom for your debt, and he paid it off. And you accepted that ransom by grace alone, then yes, you are. Now, you may, you may end up going to a place just like the, the pers person in 1 Corinthians did where he was in such terrible sin, he'd forgotten all the things he had learned, forgotten the, where he had came from, and he began to sleep with his mother. And the sin, they kept confronting him, confronting him, confronting him, and he wouldn't break for it. And God finally, or Paul finally said, I pray that we hand this man over, his body over to Satan, so that at least that he be saved still. Now, the guy did repent and come back, and they welcomed him into this fellowship. But now, I'm not wanting to get in an argument here about this topic today. All I'm wanting you to do is do this. Be honest with yourself. And that is this. If you believe you've got to keep doing works, then you've got to form for yourself your own model of living life. You've got to figure out how to do that. Okay? And, and, and work at it and go for it. And then you have to keep working, but you're going to have to keep working a lot from your own strength. What I'm 
uh, at least proclaiming to you is that God, like the Galatians, he said, just tell me this one thing. Did you begin by grace or by works? And now you think you can continue by works? He says, don't be so foolish. He calls me foolish Galatians. They don't profit you anything. Now that I come to understand that, grace becomes my motivator. It's not what motivates me to work. It's not what motivates me to love. It's not what motivates me to repent. It now motivates me that now I can't do it anymore. The law did what it was supposed to do. It shut Bill Ewing up to sin, saying, I can't live this Christian life. Father, I seem to screw up and blow it daily and daily. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for that. Thank you that you paid that penalty for me. And now it motivates me to more and more love you and want to give to you and serve to you. And it more and more motivates me to let your life become my life. And what would you like to do with it? Grace motivates you. It doesn't hinder you. It doesn't stifle you in this. Look at, uh, I don't know if, if you have this other page here, but let me read you some things, what the comparisons are between them as it comes to, to works and perfectionism. Grace becomes realistic, and law becomes idealistic. Grace says, it is, dot, dot, da, and law says, it should be, dot, dot, da. Grace says, I want to do whatever. Law says, I must do these in order to be okay. Can you repeat the first one? I got this all... I can hand you this sheet too. Grace is a process. There's progress that everything that I do in life, even if I go and I, and I mess up totally, there's a process of growing and grace with it. Works and, and law is perfect. I must be perfect. What is the product of being perfect? I have to be perfect here. Failure. Yep. Grace a request or a desire, law, always a demand, even on yourself. You know, I'm telling you all this stuff, and I can sit down with you in 15 minutes, and I can spot where you're under law, and I can see it quickly, and God reveals it with me. But I'm terrible with myself sometimes. I, I can sit there and say, oh, you really screwed up this week. You know what? I, I, I know your heart, and your heart's great, and I know what your intent of your heart was. And because of that, that leads to repentance. Let's go and let's learn how to walk through that. But if I screw up and do that, I can sit there and condemn myself a lot. And what that tells you is I'm living under performance myself. I think that the, the cross was meant for you guys, but I think I can measure up to it. Okay? And that's what we do. I'm hardest on Bill Ewing. And especially because of what I do, oh gosh, I should, I've been doing this for so long, I should have this stuff down. Why do, how could I ever blow it like that? I can't believe it. I've been a Christian this long and I'm still blowing this. What am I telling you? I'm living under law. I somehow in my mind think that my performance, after many years of doing this, my performance should start measuring up to God. Rather than saying, you know what? The grace is just as needed today as it was a long time ago for me before the foundation of the world. I can't do it. We talked last time about the trophies. Remember about what the trophies were going to look like? And, and when it says, and you will be a trophy, you're the, you're the workman, you know, you're, you're the workmanship of God's hands, and you will be trophy demonstrated trophies to, a, to the principalities and hierarchies and dominions out there. They're going to look at you, and you're going to be a trophy, a show-off trophy. When I first used to read that, I thought, here's what it was saying. Look at this cruddy Bill Ewing and the way he used to live and look at how pretty he's gotten and look at how wonderful he is and look at the trophy with God turned this slob into this godly man over here. That's the trophy. You know what it's really saying? Look at this <coughs> slob still lives like a slob and God still loves him. That's the trophy. The trophy, folks, is your performance isn't going to get perfection. And remember, one violation violates the whole thing. Guys, I don't want to say this and have you take it personally, but we're just a bunch of ugly people. And God's grace is so shined down upon us that he says that. And the angels and the principalities look at you and they take their glasses and say, I don't believe it. He still loves these people. He still loves them. That's the trophy that you and I are. Now, our heart is brand new. Your heart, every heart in here that has responded to the call of God, you have an incredible heart, folks. It is absolutely a godly heart.
Don't be frightened by it. It's not going to hurt you. It is a godly heart. It doesn't want to do bad. <clears throat> but your outer flesh and your outer performance is still going to screw up at 90 years old. When you come down to these questions, and this is why I love the talk, not next week, the week after, but the week after and the week after that. I absolutely, it's my favorite topic ever to talk on, and it is the Abba Father relationship and the character of God. And because everything we are doing is going to center into that bubble, okay? Everything. Who He is determines everything we're doing. Yeah. Well, we got our child rearing class. <laughs> we got all these classes that we're, they're, they're a long way. I think the best thing to do is to just begin to understand and live this in your life. And when you begin to go ahead and project it onto them, you teach them in, in the gates, you teach them when they fall. My kids learn more from my failures than they have from anything else in my life. And I begin to say, you know what? I remember one time giving them, they had had it and they had, they had violated something and I had this paddle and they were bent over and I went and I smacked the top bed wood to make it and it popped so loud it just smacked like that and they both went, and they looked over at each other and said, I thought he killed you. And he said, I thought he killed you. <laughs> and at that point I said, I said, that was grace. You did not, you did not get what you merited and deserved. That's just a demonstration. Now, one time yeah, I did that and they, they remember it yet today. And not only two weeks ago they were talking about their teaching on grace. So, I, you screw up and you teach them that stuff and uh, now we're going to get next week to obedience spring forth and having boundaries and having and having some rules here having some laws here That's my question. yes and we will talk about laws and we will talk about rules and we will talk about guidelines but here's here's the clincher of this you don't keep them to get a better standing with yourself or with God. They don't get you a better standing with God. They don't make you any more holy. They don't make you any more righteous. I can say to Glenn, Glenn, uh, go out. You're driving a pickup, aren't you? Oh, you're not. Okay, I thought you were. Okay, he's out here driving his car, and now the manual on his car says, fill up with unleaded gas only. If he goes out and fills up with diesel fuel, he's still an okay guy in his car. There was nothing wrong with it. His car is not a bad thing. But now guess what? His car is not going to run worth a beans. And he may be shoving it half the way home. That doesn't make him not a good person. That doesn't make him not a lovely person. It means that he decided that he knew better than the manufacturer and he thought that he could buy diesel for a little cheaper and he put it in and now he's experienced the consequences of making choices of becoming his own God. And when we do that, it says your sorrows become multiplied. This is a manual and it has, if you look at the front of this manual, it's got your model number on it. And it says Bill Ewing, model number whatever, and it says live according to this manual. Now Bill, I love you if you do live according to this manual, if you don't. And you're already in my son and you're in my kingdom regardless if you live this way or not. You can't do anything about it. You can't get out of my love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing in all of the universe can separate you now from my love because you are mine and I bought you and I will lose none. And you can count on it. But now let me give you a manual that says this is the best way to live life. And I can choose to say, I don't like your manual. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to go do these things over here, and I go do these things over here, and I experience all this frustration and hell and tough life, and then I get mad at God. And that's what happens. And that's what we live like. And so there are good boundaries, and we are going to talk about them. Okay? There's good ways of having finances, holding your finances. There's good way of giving. There's good way of doing things. But they don't make you any more loved by God. If you keep them. And you can't go ahead and go like this before God because then you think in your merit and God says, oh, you want to start measuring yourself by me? I demand perfection. And then he'll just go ahead and he'll, he loves to come on down and say, okay, so you thought you measured up here with that. Let me raise the chin up bar. Did you give every single penny from your income to me? Every single thing? Did you just write the whole check and give it over to me? No, I kept a little bit. You just violated the law. See, he just raises the standard. And I, and I help my kids know that there is good things and good structure. 
The thing that we're trying to do here today is there is freedom in grace. And you get, folks, you fall. And, and here's the point, and I told you this uh, one time before, is Martin Luther, when he went to the day of the Reformation and nailing to the doors out here and, 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 and broke away from the whole tradition of that we can be our own high priest. We don't need other high priests. And we get to read the scriptures ourselves. And we have been made new creations. And he went and talked about that. And by grace and grace alone, and then in, in, a, in a paraphrase, he basically says, now go love God and sin boldly. He actually said, the just shall live by faith. Yeah, yeah. And, what is, and, the, and what's the point here in this thing? If I make my aim just to go after loving God, I may fall off this net. I mean off this trapeze, but this net is going to hold me, and I'm not going to get caught. Here I'm going to jump right back up on the trapeze, and I'm going to keep going. And so my focus and your focus will eventually be to fall in love with this Abba Father and have this love relationship with Him and let that be the center of years of my life. He will end up telling you who you are, not me. And He will end up telling you what you can do. And He will end up doing these things and living His life through you in ways that you will experience the life of God that you're going to have to cry out like uh, D.L. Moody said, stay your hand lest I be consumed. Because the life of God is actually flowing through this vessel, and I'm about ready to explode with His glory and His joy. If, and it's all based in a relationship of knowing and loving God. And the law doesn't demand that. See, we're going to learn next week one of the things that is so critical. You and I can live under law and never even have to be with God and, have a, and never have any solitude time with Him. Because we can just go by all the things we know. I can tell you right now, I can shut this book, and this is not boasting whatsoever. I can shut this book, and I've read this book for 35 years, every morning pretty much. I can tell you the things that I probably should and shouldn't do right now. And I can go ahead and live the rest of my life pretty much giving you, I bet we could all, I could have a test for all of you in here, and you would probably all get A's on the test if I said, what are the right things to do and the wrong things to do? You'd do all right. And you never... You could do that for months and months and months and never have to be alone with your lover, who is your God. See, grace demands a moment-by-moment -moment love relationship with Him that basically hangs onto His thigh day in and day out and breathes His life and His yours. And then now for me to find out what I'm supposed to do with this dollar here, I, I gotta be with Him. I gotta be with Him.